the crowd spontaneously falls silent. So I wasn't actually planning to start for another two minutes. Um, but I guess that's what you do when your audience dictates um, how, you should, how you should publish, uh, which is why we're here tonight um, for the launch of our Tau Center and Guardian Mobile Labs report, um, which is called, I can only remember the headline now, uh, which was pushed to breaking, but I don't think that's actually, uh, that I, don't think, I know it is a nice headline, but uh, it's our um, uh, in-depth research on push alerts and how they uh, behave and impact the newsroom. Um, it's one of the many projects we do with uh, collaborators, and we've had fantastic collaboration with the Guardian Mobile Labs. I want to really thank Sasha Corrin and uh, Sarah Schmolbach is there, um, for uh, allowing us to survey and create research around what they were experimenting with. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Pete Brown, whose um, work this is, who is one of our senior research fellows here, and Max Foxman, who is one of our PhD candidates, who's had to run off and teach at NYU, um, who was also uh, instrumental in authoring the report. Um, they're part of a series of projects that we do, which call the Knight um, Innovation Projects, Projects and Innovation, um, which are funded by the Knight Foundation. Uh, one of the things we tr really try and strive to do here at the Tau Center is create research which is useful for people in the news industry. Sometimes we hit the nail on the head and sometimes we fall a little bit kind of one side or another. I think this is a great piece of research which will be really useful to people in newsrooms. Um, I know that we've got lots of people here who are actually kind of practitioners. Um, one of the things I always like to say at the beginning of these things is if you have an idea for a project, if you have a question you want answered, if you want to be a town fellow, always, always, always get in contact with us um, because we really uh, do our best work um, and are most useful to the news industry and, in fact, to our students whose uh, classrooms we feed some of this stuff back into as well um, if we are working in lockstep with, uh, with, with practitioners. Um, so tonight we are going to see the research for the first time, which Pete is going to present to you, um, and then we're going to have a great panel discussion afterwards. We had a, a sort of a discussion about it earlier in the day um, with some of the people who'd been involved in um, formulating the questions, and I sort of feel that we had two hours and we could have probably had six hours. So hopefully we'll also get to some of the questions there that are most pressing on people's minds. So um, without more ado, I'd like to hand over to Pete, if you want to come up. Oh, and by the way, if you can stick around afterwards, we do have refreshments at the back, including, I'm told, alcohol, which is very exciting. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Pete Brown. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Tau Center. Um, as Emily said, we're going to have a panel of people much more interesting than me, but before that, um, I'm going to kick off proceedings by talking through some findings from a study that we've done about push alerts we published today in partnership with the Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab. Um, I'm sure a lot of you here know a bit about the, the Innovation Lab already, but they've done a whole bunch of great work, and a lot of what they've done in the, the last year or so has been around mobile push notifications. They've done great stuff about sort of live lock screen updates. Uh, li they did a live streaming of the inauguration uh, at the lock screen level, so you didn't even have to go into an app. Um, and a whole bunch of experimentation and, uh, and research. So it's worth checking their, their work out. But they came to us and they said that they wanted kind of help providing a fuller picture of what's going on with push alerts across, across the industry. Uh, what are publishers doing push alerts? Why? What shapes strategy? What are their objectives? What are the major challenges that people face? Um, so we sat down with them and what we came up with was this kind of two-pronged attack. So we did a, a three-week content analysis um, in June and July uh, where we collected 2,500 push alerts from 31 different iOS apps over the course of three weeks. Um, and, another, um, and also part of that number was some from 14 um, Apple News channels that, that, um, that were also present. We should point out at this point that we didn't cover Android at all. That was for no reason other than we didn't have an Android device. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nothing personal. Um, but so, so that kind of helped us understand what was going on. It didn't tell us so much about why. So that's why we also we did these 23 interviews with a whole bunch of really, really smart mobile editors, product managers, and audience managers. 
Um, so just kind of kicking off with some numbers. We, on, on, uh, this is just iOS. We got just over 2,000 alerts over the course of those 21 days. Um, two, two of the outlets, CNN Moneystream and CNN, um, the main CNN app pushed over 200 alerts over the course of that, uh, over the course of that three weeks. There were four others that pushed over 100. And as you see, there's a kind of sliding scale for the others. Um, the overall average across everyone, and I should point out as well, that this is with every segment, say, personalization option switched on. So if it's breaking news and New York and sports, they would all be switched on. Um, but the overall average during the three weeks that we looked at was 3.2 alerts per app per day. But obviously, an average like that is always going to hide a huge degree of variation. Um, but just looking kind of the higher end of the scale, we had um, CNN, CNN Money Stream uh, averaged over 11 alerts per day, every day over those three weeks. Um, there were instances where both CNN and CNN Money sent 17 alerts in one day. Um, and there were six apps in which we received 10 or more, 10 or more alerts on any one given day. Um, so that's just an idea of kind of broadly what we were looking at. Um, but as well as those, the raw numbers, we wanted to take a look at a few other things, like specifically, we wanted to dig deeper into those numbers to understand things about, for example, breaking news. Because clearly, when you're dealing with 17 alerts in a day, they're unlikely to be about sort of super pressing breaking news stories. So we wanted to understand what people are doing and why. Um, now, because of with the, with the way push alerts have kind of risen to prominence recently, almost everybody's looking beyond breaking news as they kind of recognize the, the, the need to differentiate their alerts from those of their competitors, because obviously breaking news often looks very similar. Um, so one mobile ad said from a news agency said, everybody knows that breaking news is commoditized to the point that there's a question about whether there's value in that. All of us in the industry who think about this are going to start reconsidering what that content should be. And maybe when everybody is sending that same push, finding a way to distinguish your own news outlet by pointing to explanatory material and analytical material and having an engaging way to get people there. There might be such value in that that we may at some point sort of pass the breaking news itself. Um, and that was kind of a recurring theme. Um, another mobile editor from a, from a major newspaper said, it's kind of described how that had played out. He said, we've gotten more proactive in the past couple of years in a few areas, one being major enterprise, major investigations, really in-depth features. We do a lot more pushes for those than we used to. And that sort of came about partially as a recognition that that's what makes us who we are, and it's our signature content. Which kind of struck me as a very, uh, it's a very striking comment to me, because it, it kind of highlighted a way in which alerts have become a really valuable place for news outlets to, to, they feel it's important to remind their audience who they are and what they do and what they do well. And alerts are a really strong way of doing that. Um, and what people were saying to us about kind of the shift away from breaking news totally played out in the, in the data that we saw. So over the course of those three weeks, we coded whether or not the story, the alert was related to a breaking news story or non-breaking. And what we saw was that over two-fifths, so over two in every five of the alerts, were not about breaking news. Um, so clearly, we can see breaking news is still significant, but people are looking for ways to, to look beyond breaking news, other ways to engage their audiences. And that was even more pronounced on Apple News, um, where three quarters of the alerts that were sent via Apple News were not about breaking news, only a quarter were. Um, and Apple News is actually used very differently um, in a number of ways, and that's covered in quite a, a lengthy section in the reports. Um, so in addition to breaking news, we also wanted to look at the style of the alerts, um, what kind of actions they necessitate from the user. Um, and this is another area where there's been real change in the kind of last 12 to 18 months or so. Um, it's not, you know, you wouldn't have to go that far into the past for a time when the average news alert was just a straight headline that was designed to get you into the app to, to, to understand the story. But though that's kind of a, that's been consigned to the past. Um, a lot of people that, that I spoke to for this research talked about inf informing from the lock screen. So essentially giving people the news in the alert so they aren't even necessarily forced through to the app to understand what the story is. To the extent that for some, if their user has to click through to understand the story, they haven't done a good enough job of crafting the alert. They kind of consider that a failure. Um, and the, the most prominent example of that is, is Mike's app, who the splash screen for them is... This, uh, this introduction that said, nobody likes opening apps. You can watch the news right here from the lock screen. I don't know if the sound is going to work on this. It's not. But this guy is, uh, this is, this is the splash video you get when you open the mic app. You can watch news explain right from you. your lock screen. You're welcome, because unlocking your phone is a pain in the ass. 
And what that looks like for Mike is that you get the little at uh, the top, which is just the, the story. When you um, force tap on it, do 3D touch, then you come up with, you know, their lengthy sort of four paragraph story that is giving you, you ha having to go anywhere near their app, that's purely at the lock stream level. Um, so obviously Mike is, Mike's way ahead in terms of that and not generally at this point, people are not following suit. But we did want to understand more about this idea of kind of providing additional context at lock screen level. So the way we did, went about that was we categorized every alert into one of uh, four buckets. It either as a headline, where, you know, just what you'd see in a newspaper, a teaser, which would just, could just be a question, something that's purely designed to drive you into the app, um, doesn't really tell you anything at the alert level. A roundup, which is typically a uh, collection of headlines or sort of two or three nuggets of a story, but, but nothing really more or what we called additional context. And these are ones that we were really interested in. Um, we also had a category called other, but that was essentially just um, Quartz's high Q alerts. Um, but again, this was another area where the data that we got back from the content analysis very much matched up with what people had said to us in the interviews. Um, of the, this is again focusing just on the iOS alerts. Over half were what we coded as additional context. Um, so clearly you can see that there is a trend, there is a trend for, uh, for this style of alert. There was still a quarter that were, that were headlines, but again, that's totally expected. For, for some reason, that's just their business model. That's what they do. Um, and also, if it's a breaking news story, often news organizations don't have any more context than the headline, but they want it to get it out as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, we, we could see the additional context was, was what was going on. Um, another area we wanted to look at was how people are uh, embedding rich media into their, into their alerts. For iOS, it's been on Android for a while, but on iOS, rich media is a relatively recent phenomenon. It only became possible to add photos and videos in the last, with iOS 10, which came out last year. And so we want to kind of get a grasp of if and how publishers are taking advantage of those, of those capabilities. Um, as you can see, there's five examples there, of sort of slightly different ways to do it, but essentially it comes down to either an image, an animated GIF, or a video. Um, what we found was at the time that we did it, it's possible this has changed slightly in the meantime, but 12 of the 31 iOS apps that we included were using some kind of um, used uh, rich media at least once. Um, but what that tells you is that the majority weren't, 19 at the, the other 19 at that point weren't using them. Um, so in this example, the, 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 blue, um, the blue is for images, Orange is for videos and gray is for animated GIFs. And you can see that where people are using um, rich media of some variety, it's predominantly, it's, it's invariably um, images. So we haven't seen the, uh, the, the pivot to video at the lock screen level just yet. But there are um, USA Today and Milwaukee Journey, Journal Sentinel are two that use videos quite frequently, which is something that kind of makes sense because USA Today considers itself a very kind of visual brand. Um, and they're both part of the USA Today network. So that, that very much fits with kind of the, the, the overall organizational brand. Um, what this one shows is kind of the proportion. So we're looking at the same organizations and their use of rich media. But this is the proportion of their alerts that, can, that contain an image or a, or a video. Um, and what you can see is kind of how significant already this seems to have come, become to certain organizations. Um, so USA Today, NBC News, Milwaukee Journal Centennial, and Mike were attaching alerts to almost every single alert. In case of two, it was every single alert we received. Um, Wall Street Journal and Quartz were about two thirds, so I think for the journal it's probably now higher. Um, and it's kind of a measure of how quickly this stuff has shifted. That kind of at the bottom there, we've got The Guardian who a, there was only 37 alerts. I feel like I get more than that now. The other is 11% contained an alert, but even yesterday, I received three from The Guardian that contained an image. So it looks to me like that's something that, that, that's already shifting. So that's another organization that's kind of embracing it in a way that, that they weren't before. And last but not least is no discussion of push alerts is ever complete without a nod to the emoji. So it's absolutely mind-blowing the extent, the level of thought that people are giving to whether or not they're going to use emojis in their alerts. It's not just do we use them or not, is it appropriate to our brand, if we use them, how many do we use, do we use them at the beginning of an alert, do we use them at the end, do we use punctuation before and after, these are genuinely the kind of questions that, that people, are, conversations that people are having in their newsrooms. Um, 
And there was so much said about them that the appendix to the report that came out today is a kind of a beginner's guide to emoji because there was so much conversation around what people were doing. Um, so another thing that's kind of interesting about the level of uh, thought that's going into it is that of the 31 iOS apps that we included, only six actually used an emoji in the, in the three weeks that we looked at. Um, and you can see that CNN Money is very, very fond of an emoji. They used 200, a total of 206 emojis over the course of three weeks. Um, 124 out of their 234 alerts con con contained an emoji. So that's 57%, around about three-fifths, contain at least one emoji. The most they used in any one was four. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of a broad landscape overview of what, what we saw. And kind of enough numbers. We've, um, because for all the, kind of the great work that's happening, people, with working, people that have worked with Pushlows are really grappling with a whole bunch of different challenges. Um, so before we move on to the panel, um, we're just going to quickly kind of go over 10 of those kind of the most prominent challenges that, that, that emerge. So the, number, the first one is also sort of the most obvious one. And that's just this issue of how do you stand out on uh, how do you stand out on a crowded lock screen, um, particularly when it's you know this is an example of uh, this is when the Supreme Court allowed a limited version of Trump's travel ban to stop. We received twenty almost identical news alerts over the course of fourteen minutes from the variety of um, from the variety of apps that, that we had. And so now, obviously, the, the obvious caveat here is that the average person doesn't have all those news. Um, those apps on their phone. But when you see kind of how quickly they came in together, um, how similar they are in kind of text and context, you can see how difficult it is to make your brand stand out from somebody else's. So that's something that people are giving a lot of thought to and really kind of worrying about. Um, the second, this is the big one. Um, a lot of people would talk again and again at just the, the tools that they use in the newsroom are a hindrance. Now, obviously, this is far from exclusive to push alerts. People complain about the tools they use all the time. Um, but people have very specific examples of how the tools kind of hindered their work. So that people would say, you know, they're using this, the, the, the push is kind of bundled into the same tool and workflows as they use for other types of breaking news. So the homepage banner, the tweet, the push, they all get bundled in together. They just go out as one, and it's, um, they can't really kind of give any dedicated thought to the push. Um, so one mobile editor said to me, the tools are hard to use, they're cumbersome, they're kind of tedious. So that probably puts a little bit of a chilling effect on us doing more and takes up time we could be using elsewhere. Uh, another mobile editor said, we're limited by the tool that we use because for breaking news at least, we use the same tool to send out the push alerts as we do to send the tweet and to put the banner on the homepage. So it's all wrapped together in one tool. I think in certain cases we do the push alert a disservice because we're trying to meet other needs with the same tool. Um, a third, a third challenge that people talked about frequently and easy, easy to understand is this kind of this desire to be able to segment the orders and offer far more personalization in terms of the alerts that people get. So people can choose you know, to get alerts about things they are interested in and kind of filter out the ones that they're not interested in. Um, a lot, if people had it, they loved it. If they didn't have it, they desperately wanted it. One person said to me, it's something we desperately want and we're begging our product counterparts to build. Um, and the, these really vary from one app to the next. The most we saw in any one app was over 100. Um, but a lot of them, 17 of the 34, the 31 that I looked at, only had one um, alert channel. So it would typically be breaking news or alerts on or off. And that's all you can do. Um, but these are three examples of, um, of ones which, which I find quite interesting. The two on the left are CNN Money and the Dallas Morning News, both of which offer eye-watering levels of customization. <laughs> Um, the idea that anyone is going to sit down and kind of filter, you know, go through those individually is kind of ludicrous to me, but possibly people do. Um, the one on the right is from the main CNN app, which again is one that we saw pushes frequently. And they're, they, they're, I find their kind of approach interesting because they've done it not by subject, but it's just frequency. So they give you these three options of just the big stuff, which they say is likely to be zero to two per day, uh, the day's top news, which they say is likely to be three to six or can't miss a thing, which is what we had switched on, which was seven or more. And as we saw, their average was around about 11. Um, but if you contrast that with you know, some other, other big players, Bloomberg has notifications on or off. That's, that's all you've got. Fox News has breaking news on, on or off, which often it's, you know, we've got a TV show about to come on. Um, and BBC News 
doesn't even have it in their app. You have to go to the system. They just say, oh, hey, go to your system settings and switch it on or off there. We, we don't care. Um, so that's kind of a, the, an illustration of the differing levels of segmentation that, that are currently on offer. Uh, and as I say, those, those that don't have it invariably said they really wanted it. Um, but personalization also potentially creates as many problems as it solves. So if, you know, some, some people kind of envisage this, this, this future, in, you know, not too distant future, wherein their audiences can, can, can come down to the real minutia of, if, if as soon as a story is published about this niche topic that I'm interested in, I want to get a push alert about it. I want to, I want to know. But that's going to need a whole bunch, you know, it's going to need language to be prepared for every single article. It requires new workflows. It requires cooperation from across the newsroom. It requires potentially new systems, things like that. Another really interesting point about this that someone raised was that it could also kind of lead to a small contribution to this problem that we talk about a lot at the moment, which is echo chambers. Uh, one audience manager said to me, at the moment, we're in a very fortunate position where if you think a story is incredibly valuable and everybody must know about it, you can tell them about it. But the more personalized notifications become, the more you're running the risk of getting into a filter bowl within an area where you once had a fair bit of control. So you know, personalization is a good thing, also has drawbacks. Uh, fifth one is specifically relates to local news. We, we made an effort to include some local news um, outlets both in the content analysis and in terms of the people that we interviewed. Um, and one thing that a lot of people said is they're struggling to establish how much national and global news their, their regional audiences expect them to alert to. So one, on this, one mobile editor said to me, this is something we still grapple with. You didn't sign up for alerts to get alerts to AP or Washington Post stories, both of which are wire services. But if, for some reason, we're the only alert that you get, we do have a responsibility to tell you about certain things that are happening in the world. We're just struggling to figure out where exactly we fall for readers, because obviously we're the go-to source for city news, for many statewide news, and for some Midwestern news. Um, so this was something that we looked at. We dug into the data a little to see how this kind of played out. And again, it was, you know, people, it was kind of true to what people had said. So um, here, a, a, if a push had a uh, pushes with kind of a regional slant are in blue, those that are kind of national or global are in orange. Um, and the, for the eight regional apps that we looked at, there was clearly a strong focus on regional news. Overall, across all of them, 84% of the alerts that we received were from regional um, from 84% of the alerts we received from regional publications had some kind of regional slant on them. Um, and often that could be as minute as weather, um, or one thing that we saw frequently was if, uh, say there'd be a global story involving um, you know, a ma major political decision, they would focus in on what a local senator had contributed to it. So they would kind of give it a regional slant in that way. Uh, number six, um, there's, there's a real question about People want, uh, in newsrooms kind of wonder whether there's a need to educate the audience and make them aware that alerts can, to, can actually be expanded and, and can be seen. This is something we talked a little bit about this afternoon. Um, because if the audiences don't know that they can do these things, a lot of the work that news organizations are doing with their alerts at expanded level is completely going to waste. So as we kind of touched on before with the mic example, some publishers are starting to offer far more content at lock screen level. But there is this concern that audiences aren't aware that they can see it. So we've got the mic example here. We've essentially got the full story. USA Today, where you get you know, a headline and a, um, and a lead. But then there's a, a kind of a pretty uh, conclusive video there. And Milwaukee Gen Journal Centennial is, um, is, a, is a photo and a headline and, and the lead. But people need to know that it's there. And it's kind of up in there whose responsibility it is to, to make people aware of that. Uh, Number seven, and this is by far and away the most recurrent complaint people have, is that the metrics, the analytics they have about push alerts are just really dreadful. Um, there were, one, of the, one of the sort of the launch points for this was that people would say that the metrics they have for push are far fewer than, there are far fewer metrics for push than they have for almost every other aspect of their digital news output. Um, so one mobile editor said to me, I struggle with metrics because there really is no metrics beside direct opens, yet we have so many different things with both our app and the web that mean we can look at scroll downs, time on the page, opens, uniques, time of day. There are so many things that we can look at with a regular story that we cannot do with push. And this really is the tip of the iceberg. Um, another one that people talked about frequently, and then we have a fun graphic coming up, is that a lot of the metrics they get back are based on devices rather than on users. Um, 
And so in a kind of a, a clunky attempt to, to illustrate that, what we've got here is um, a, we have a user at the bottom, user one. Uh, let's call her Sarah. Sarah has these three devices, uh, an iPhone, an Android phone, and an iPad, and a news outlet pushes an alert out, and they want to reach Sarah but it goes to all three of those devices. Sarah opens it on device one, her iPhone. Um, if you the, the device-based metric would be 33% open rate. It's been open on one of three devices. But news organizations don't want to know the devices they reach. They care about Sarah. They care about the users. And if you just had a user-based metric for the same alert, you'd have a 100% open rate for that user. And that's something that uh, no one's really got to the bottom of. Um, but as I say, that's that really is the tip of the iceberg. That's one of many complaints. Other, other people, there's another complaint that people are forced to focus on open rates, even though they're crafting the alerts that don't necessarily need to be clicked on. So there's this kind of vicious cycle without, without the feedback loop where people want to get value from, they want to offer value just from the alert, yet they're being judged on whether the audience clicked on this thing that they're d deliberately trying to provide enough context so that they don't need to. Um, what's more, Lots of people kind of pointed out that the metrics, quant quantitative metrics, can't tell publishers what they really want to know, which is whether audiences actually value the alerts they get, whether they get some value from them. Um, because again, alerts are kind of very, um, they're very personal. Some people are happy just kind of to get it and know what the news and not care, um, but there's no way of telling. Um, and it, we heard people again and again say that it's very difficult to kind of measure success in the way that they think about success. Um, so one mobile editor said, I think a successful push notification is one where somebody opens their phone, looks at it, says, that's interesting, puts their phone back in their pocket. All I want is for our readers to feel like they're informed or they're interested. If the pushes do that, to me, that's a success, and that's fine. Uh, another mobile editor from a regional news outlet said, the bigger thing is, how do we measure su successful alerts? We're not sitting next to everyone as their phone goes up and saying, now, did you open that? Did you get everything you need to get without opening that? Did you appreciate getting it? It's just sort of an impossible thing to measure without doing a really wide-ranging survey, which we're not going to do. Um, and kind of taking that even further, another mobile editor said, at a broad level, I hope they're happy they got it or they found it to be valued. That's my number one goal. But we can't measure that. That's a frustration of ours. We can't measure whether people think something was valuable or useful or helpful. So what data do we look at? So I do really think there's kind of a, there's a strong, there's a, there's a real need for kind of a more qualitative research analysis to be done with audiences to kind of understand what's going on and, and to answer those questions that, that, that people have. Um, ninth, penultimate one, number nine, is um, people talked about kind of the desire to make push more central to newsroom culture and workflows. This is, this is one of two related to the newsroom. Um, and people would... People would say that you know they'd like the people who are closest to the stories to get more involved. The people that are writing it. Could they suggest language for the push? Could they write the alerts, etc.? Um, people said that they wanted you know direct quotes. That they wanted more buy-in from across the newsroom. Um, one really nice quote that someone said, which was just integrating push into the into the rhythms of the newsroom, is still something that we're working on. And that that was a kind of a recurring theme. And the the, the final point for me is is also newsroom related, um, and is interconnected. And also kind of goes back to metrics as well. It kind of, kind of combines all of them. But the, the, a lot of people kind of talked about the need to create some kind of shared vision for, for, for push. Like they would they, they, people in their team, the mobile teams, for example, think about push very differently to the way their bosses do or, or people elsewhere in the newsroom. And the, the, the idea to kind of have this shared vision that goes up and down the newsroom is it something that people would really like? Because obviously people have different objectives and different understandings of the role of push and different con conceptualizations of what is a success. So one product manager said to me, getting everyone aligned on a real user-focused strategy can sometimes be difficult because there seem to be other business goals or brand goals that people want to push for. That mentality, that mindset is the biggest challenge that we have to work against. Um, and this, th this is the key problem here is it can manifest in people elsewhere, you know, again, kind of senior people, putting too much emphasis on, on these kind of base, flawed metrics like open rates or like speed. Um, so an another mobile editor said to me, I'm not necessarily 100% in agreement with my business side counterparts. For them, they get really excited when they just see lots of big numbers and don't necessarily understand the nuance between are we serving our readers with just that, with just that push alert. And this person actually went on to talk about some recent alerts that, in her words, had done too well and attra attracted too much attention. And that had led to kind of undue pressure to try and replicate that big numbers. And as she pointed out, 
That alert did particularly well because it was a big story that appealed to everyone and was kind of clickable, but you can't control the news. That was worked on that day because that was the news. Um, and the final point is related to, the, to this idea of speed. And speed was an interesting one to me because I operated on the basis that it's still an area where people want to be first. It was people would want the scoop, but there was a real... Multiple people brought it up, and it really feels like there's a, there's a changing mindset around this, around this idea of the importance of speed. Um, so a mobile editor said to me that one of the things that I don't particularly value, which is valued by some of my bosses, that I feel, about, that I feel like I fight with every day is speed. Um, and this, for, for, for the people that said it, often came down to kind of too much emphasis being put on old-fashioned rivalries between newspaper brands. Um, and it kind of forgets that people, unlike you know, journalists or news nerds or whoever, haven't got multiple apps sitting on their phone. They're not watching which one got it first or who, it, you know, they're not, they're not comparing the AP with the New York Times with the Wall Street Journal with the Washington Post. They just want the news. And that seems to kind of filtered through in some ways. Because people say that they would rather, they would rather be, be last and best than, you know, first and worst. Um, and so that's something that, that's kind of a, a cultural shift that, that does seem to be, that does seem to be happening. I heard that from multiple people. Okay, that's kind of, that's it for me on, on the findings. The report is out. Um, if you go to the Tau Center Twitter, you'll be able to get a, um, it's on CGI, you'll be able to get a link to the entire thing. Um, but, so yeah, please try and read some of the report. I know no one's going to read all of it. Um, but kind of what we want to do next is, as I mentioned, we want to do more research with this. It's, we had a session today that was, as Emily said, it was two hours. It could have been six or seven hours. There's lots of things that people are struggling with. There are lots of things that people are doing really well. There are loads of opportunities to do research. So we want to do that. I want to do it. If there are people here from news outlets that want to get involved, collaboration is going to be the way forward. So send, us a, send me an email. Come and talk to me. Reach out, whatever. Um, but that's it from me. So I guess we'll bring up the panel, which is led by Sasha Corrin from uh, Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab. And we have Harry Slater from The Guardian US, Megan Hess from Bloomberg, and Greg Emerson from The Wall Street Journal. Uh, is this, this seems to be on. OK, good. Um, thank you, Pete. And thank you, Emily, and the rest of the Tau Center for hosting this and for uh, being such great collaborators. And Pete especially has worked long and hard on this report. And, um, we couldn't be more pleased with sort of what it's offering to the industry as, as far as insights. Um, so um, let's just dive in. And if you wouldn't mind so sort of reintroducing yourself and telling the audience sort of what your role is within the, the organization. But I want to start first with uh, the, how PUSH is understood in, as part of your organization's culture. Um, so how does your organization, your newsroom, or uh, the culture around, how, do, how is PUSH understood? Would you like it to be better understood? Or is there sort of a broad understanding? Is it too narrow? Um, Harry, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, so hello, I'm Harry uh, from The Guardian, head of audience development there. Um, so PUSH in our newsroom, we kind of consider it uh, as a two-pronged way, really. It's sort of to either reach readers with uh, breaking news, so the news of the day, I'm sure it is for a lot of other people. Um, and then we also uh, use it as ways to tell them about either enterprise pieces or special reports, investigations, that kind of stuff that, that we consider to be really newsworthy, but isn't necessarily um, going to be reported by everybody else because it's not their story and because it's one of ours. Um, it's also a really crucial way for us to have uh, a relationship with our most loyal readers. So, uh, again, probably it's the same for a lot of other organizations. Um, our most loyal readers use the app as well. So it's a chance to be uh, sort of in their life uh, a couple of times a day, uh, at least. Um, hi, I'm Megan Hess. I'm a mobile editor at Bloomberg. Um, we kind of oversee from the editorial side our, our mobile app as well as some other mobile products. So work closely with business and developer counterparts. Um, similar to Harry, we kind of see it as like a way, a vehicle for breaking news as well as a vehicle to highlight um, some signature stories. We also tend to kind of like at different points throughout the day, kind of I'll check, like we have a check-in um, online with a bunch of news editors and say, okay, what do we have today that's really great? What's uh, push alert potential? Um, 
for the mornings or the afternoons or the evening commutes. Um, but we also obviously really highlight um, market moving news, major acquisitions. Those are um, like big global breaking news, probably a little bit less commoditized news than um, like the Journal or New York Times or Washington Post. Um, Thanks. Hi, I'm Greg Emerson from the Wall Street Journal. I am a mobile product manager and uh, sort of uh, been on the ground with Push since I got to the Journal two years ago. And in fact, a lot of the ways that the Journal sees Push has evolved, uh, have evolved quite a bit since I've been there, where I think initially we saw it as sort of an a integral part of our breaking news presentation, right? Like you do the tweet, you do the headline and the banner on the homepage, and you send out the Push notification. I think over the past two years, as we've really started to look at the data, we've seen it more as a, you know, a, more broadly as an engagement tool. Like it's not just to make sure more people see our breaking news, but it's a way to even bring them closer to our brand and closer to our product and closer to that news and our coverage itself. That along with a trend toward uh, not only pushing on breaking news and sort of uh, expanding the, the category of things that we think worth intruding on people's lock screens. And uh, we've seen a lot of great feedback from our audience on that, so it's still actively in flux to be sort of looking at how we use it and thinking of new ways that we can use Push to bring our audience into the product, into the mobile apps. And you recently, the journal recently launched um, quite a big degree of personalization, um, which is something that I think we're still seeing a lot of variation on, and probably a lot of different opinions on whether or not personalization is worth it or works. Can you talk about like the decision that the organization made to to go that route and what you're seeing from it so far? Yeah, for sure. We initially, before the 2016 election earlier that year, we realized that with the election coming up, there was a huge interest in this category of content for us. So we figured we would use push, we would experiment with a politics category as a push notification offering. We deliberately started with one category. And the response was incredible. Uh, on the one hand, we saw a huge amount of engagement on those politics pushes, but there was an unintended or, or unforeseen effect of that where we had seen that by offering a category that people might be more interested in, they, we saw a lot of people who were opted out of push on a system level opt back in so that they could get the politics notifications and in the vast majority of those cases, the people also signed up for breaking news pushes. So it really expanded our push audience just by offering one new category. This year, we, we doubled down on that or maybe tripled down on that by offering uh, an additional seven categories that people could sign up for. And we had made sure to sort of train the newsroom to make those workflows part of the different departments uh, thought in presenting their content. Uh, and then we also introduced the ability to follow a favorite author by uh, tapping their byline on an article and getting a push notification whenever they publish something. So while the adoption of these pushes of the different categories and the followed authors has not reached the scale that our breaking news pushes do, the engagement on them is incredibly high. So what we're seeing is people are really embracing that. and. Part of the internal discussion, we definitely worried about, like, are we going to bombard people with too much push, too many messages on the lock screen, and they're going to get overwhelmed, and they're going to hate us. And what we have found is that it's almost completely additive. You know, our, our app visitation has been growing pretty steadily and growing in proportion with our acquisition of new mobile app users in general. But uh, on top of that, the amount of new visits created from push notifications has just boosted that, num that uh, increase in visits out of proportion with just our organic growth. So what we've seen is that it's not cannibalizing visits that otherwise people would be making, but now that they have the information on the lock screen, they're not making that visit. What we've seen is it's additive. Uh, it seems like push is bringing people in at times when they otherwise might not have launched the app. So it's been a, a big success for us, and we're definitely planning a few more ways to, to capitalize on that even further. So it's a bit of a loyalty tool or a, a way of sort of increasing your relationship or, con or your connection with those particular readers. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it is. We did a big, uh, gigantic user research project for about six months at the beginning of this year. And one thing we heard from people is they want a closer relationship with the journal. They want a closer relationship with this exclusive premium brand might not be the same for every publisher, but we did see that people had relationships with their favorite authors and might be interested in this, and uh, we found that that's absolutely true. Yeah. That's 
Great. Um, now, Megan, not to put you on the spot, but uh, since Pete did show the screen from Bloomberg with just on off, um, is that is that a, a sort of strategic choice? Is it something that sort of you personally or the organization have talked about or would like to do more with in terms of personalization? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yep. Um, so one kind of thing I think initially that the thinking behind that was um, Bloomberg is more of we co it's business coverage. It's not um, somewhere that has really like, we do do politics coverage, we do a lot of other coverage, but it's through the lens of business. So it's kind of your already, um, like what your business notification, your business personalization might be within a larger um, app with like the Times or something like that. Um, you're already getting that with Bloomberg because it's already kind of specialized coverage. Um, so I think that was the initial thinking. What we're kind of looking at right now, I'm personally, I think, a little bit um, not convinced that people spend a ton of time going into the settings and like toggling on all these different uh, different kinds of personalizations. I think like as news nerds and probably everyone here, we do that. But like as a general population, I don't think people are spending a ton of time caring about that or doing yeah, we're that. We're not really normal people. Right. Really. <laughs> right. Um, so I think one thing that's interesting is, well, that, that we're thinking about is how to um, target people based on behaviors. So not just topic level, but saying, you know, if we know a user has watched a vi like X number of videos in our app for X days consecutively, can we push this audience um, an additional a video push alert that we might not push to the entire um, app user base. Um, so kind of thinking about segmenting our audience based on, based on user behaviors. Um, I think also something we're thinking about is more, um, more personalization based on geography. So right now we have editions of our app um, based, on, based on your geolocation with the most popular ones being Americas, Europe, and Asia. Um, and we have the ability right now to send different alerts to each of those different regions. Um, which is still a fairly like high level breakdown, like all of Europe, all of Asia. So kind of looking at how we, we have a lot of stories that um, are much more niche, like just about India or the currency in Australia and sending, sending per more personalized alerts to specific regions, either on a city level, a state level. Um, do you have concerns at all or do, do, has this come up in the conversations about them about sort of any uh, unwanted byproducts from limiting or from targeting without sort of notifying people that you're doing so? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. I think it probably wouldn't, um, it wouldn't, ch like it, we, it wouldn't be something that you would say like, why am I getting this? It wouldn't be soup that, that niche. Um, it would kind of enhance the user experience. I think also the, um, when you personalize something, there's a little bit on an editor level more comfort with sending more push alerts mm -hmm. because you kind of know, um, we know that this person is potentially probably interested in this topic or they live in this area so they're going to be more interested in this subject. Whereas um, if you're sending it to everyone who's registered for your push alerts, you are worried about whether it's coming across as spammy um, or what the interest mm -hmm. level is going to be, and we tend to like hold back with that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So the hope is that with personalization, we can um, send even more of our content uh, than we already do. Because as you could tell from those slides, we're on like the lower end of number of push alerts. Right, right. Um, well, not as low as the Guardian. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit worrying. We need to. Need to I was actually surprised bit. by that, but um, but just I wonder, Harry, if you could talk because we. We, or the Guardian US has had the ability to target to the US as well as sort of the segmentation um, has covered the other regions that the Guardian has bases in, um, UK obviously, but also Australia. And how have you seen that play out and have you been able to sort of um, get any kind of information about sort of what the audience sees and what they would like from that yeah, segmentation? I, I think that the segmentation is really interesting. So we have, uh, Basically, the way you opt into notifications with us in iOS and Android is uh, it's done through the edition of the app that you're in. So if you're in the US, you get the US edition. If you're in the UK, you get UK. If you're in Australia, you get the Australian one. And then everywhere else in the world, 
you get our international edition, which is meant to give you a flavor of everything. Obviously, there are a lot of other countries in the rest of the world, so the push notification <laughs> we send you could vary quite a lot. So if you're in India and we're telling you about something that's happened in Canada, maybe that's not going to be particularly relevant to you. So I'd quite like to see sort of a more country-based or continent-based uh, sort of way of sending those notifications. Um, in terms of kind of personalizing to those users, uh, I think it comes back to the kind of the point about the, the, the tools that we use that, that Pete mentioned his report, and that is that um, we can send to those different regions, we can send different language, uh, and you can send them at different times of day, but they're fiddly and people don't do them because it's a couple of extra clicks. And, and I think there's a real issue there that if we can do it, we should be doing it, and the couple of clicks shouldn't be stopping us from personalizing uh, news to our most loyal readers. Um, and so it, are there, do you find that sort of in the discussion of personalization or sort of like in a, in a breaking news setting, is there an active conversation about who to send to and where it, where it needs to go, who needs to know this kind of information? Yeah, definitely. So uh, normally we kind of liaise between the, the news desk in London and New York about mm -hmm. where we're going to send stuff to. And there's normally a bit of back and forth, uh, which I think is very good. And it's good that we talk about it. Um, Generally, if we're anxious, we'll send to one region first and then uh, either see how it does and then maybe send to another. Um, but there's a good level of conversation. I'm not sure how much further that conversation can go if we can't go any further in personalizing who gets the news depending on where they are in the world. I think that the next thing that needs to happen is the tools need to change before we can mm -hmm. have more of a meaningful discussion about it, really. And how about tools? I mean, you, you've, we've sort of have a really great homegrown system at The Guardian that mm. is, um, serves a lot of needs and is actually probably better than a lot. But what I'm just curious to know from each of you sort of what you would like in terms of tools. What would you ideally have at your disposal to be able to sort of optimize to the audience to, um, to be able to sort of have a granular um, response, uh, tools as well as metrics? Just a whole other can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like some. Sorry, I'd, I'd like some uh, some A/B testing in real time. Mm -hmm. um, that would be great because I think that would solve um, a lot of debate around what works and what doesn't, and just to be able to see it immediately would be fantastic in front of your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. A/B testing for content as well as timing. Um, I think right now for non-breaking news push alerts, if we're doing something featuresy or on the weekend, it's like almost like a shot in the dark, like when we're scheduling it for, um, like do we do a 10 a.m. or do a lot, of, a lot of alerts come on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m., do we do the afternoon instead? Um, so kind of being able to A-B test with uh, a more evergreen type of alert at different times of day. Um, obviously taking into consideration that people are maybe more on their phones at different times of day. Um, I think also in, we send them via, we send alerts via our CMS, like a separate alerts page within there, um, so it's not kind of baked into the same tool as a tweet or a banner on a homepage. Um, but one thing I'd like to see is having more analytics baked into the, the page, like the alerts page, mm -hmm. where you have like, maybe you have the compose area and then like the list of alerts that have been sent to what regions and exactly how they performed, like their conversion rates. Um, that visibility, I think for, for other editors and seeing that and kind of the, the lift that push alerts can have um, in a very obvious, clear way uh, can also help like get newsroom buy-in. Mm. Yeah, I think there's an interesting way in which tools can, can be an agent for a culture change mm -hmm. in a really interesting way, which is sort of a little bit counterintuitive. Like you would think culture change has to change first and then you have the tool, but if you put something in front of someone it's very clear sort of what it's, what it's showing them and then it sort of puts it in their head in a different way, I guess. Yeah, and so. even though we had talked about like the frustration with um, opens being the only metric, like there's still, there's still a lot of value in that and that's still like the main number that is really looked at. Um, so surfacing that more, I think. So about uh, six months ago, we introduced something like that into uh, OFAM, which is our in-house analytics tool. And it's a really simple, quite boring and ugly page, actually. Um, no, which it's just, great. It's, well, no, OFAM's <laughs> brilliant. This, this particular page is, is really oh, dull. Okay. Um, uh, but it, it's just a list of the, the most recent notifications we sent, I think uh, 20 or so, or maybe from the past seven days. And it just shows you the language that we used, uh, who we sent it to, uh, the time, uh, and who sent it as well, which has been 
very useful to find out who's doing what. <laughs> uh, and it's really simple. And then it just takes you through it and shows you the referral for that particular notification. But just by putting that uh, kind of data out there and getting people to think about it is, is kind of the data that does change the culture. And it's, um, it's used by a very small group of people because the people that send notifications uh, are quite few. But uh, it's, it's had some kind of real positive effects. The next thing I'd like to do is get it in front of everybody in every page in OFAN where it's relevant so that everyone can see it and is thinking about it. Yeah, OFAN, I, I've seen uh, in-house analytics tools, and this one is really quite amazing. And I think if I ever work at another organization, I'm going to sort of constantly be referencing OFAN. But um, uh, Greg, how about you? How about? Yeah, we, you know, it's, it's funny because data has probably been the number one driver of the culture change mm -hmm. at, the, at the Wall Street Journal to really uh, dig into performance metrics in a pretty deep way. But it's funny that you mentioned that the tool also breeds culture change because we have an in-house tool that we have traditionally used to send a breaking news alert, put a banner on the homepage, send the tweet to our breaking news Twitter account, which was you know automated just from this tool. And we made a deliberate decision to keep all this new exciting push functionality, these categories, and uh, even with Apple News pushes, we built these all into the tool because it was a familiar place that editors were used to going. Now, the problem is push is evolving incredibly rapidly. So we have not been able to keep our tool up to date with the latest push functionality, which uh, benefits us because uh, the few of us who are trained on, we use a third party partner you may have heard of called Urban Airship that handles you know, the, the delivery to Apple and Google after it comes out of our tool. And they have their own message composer there, and they are much more on top of improving their platform to take advantage of the new OS uh, features around push. So we do use A-B testing there, and we do use segmentation there in ways that we don't have to build into all of our other tools. We can look at someone's activity level and say, send this push to someone who hasn't opened the app in a week. Um, and we've been able to do on the fly kind of things. We had this, this blog post that was a Sunday afternoon blog post that never got too much interest, but uh, the economy week ahead, I'm sure a million, all of you <laughs> in this room would be tapping on that instantly. But uh, you know, what we realized was there's probably an audience for this, but it's probably tiny. But, so what we were able to do would be, was using the tool, if someone tapped on that alert, they were put into this cohort of people who actually tapped on that alert. And then subsequently, we started sending only to that group of people that had opened one previously. And it's a piece of content we don't push anymore, but, uh, but it was important to get that in the tool. And going back to data just for a second, because that was another part of your question and something I love and think about quite a bit, uh, the one, like one big limitation that we have is we get push metrics, and they go as granular as hour by hour, but with something like push, you really want I want minute by minute uh, metrics on that because, you know, when pushes are being sent at all times of day at every you know minute in the hour, there different types of pushes have a different curve of response. You know, so if something is if a push is sent at 9:48, you know, it'll get a certain amount of opens attributed to the nine o'clock hour and then a bunch to the 10 o'clock hour. What I would love to do is standardize push response across all pushes by saying like you know push plus five minutes, push plus 10 minutes, push plus an hour, and really be able to compare the audience's response to every push uh, in terms of their eagerness for that kind of news, their eagerness to read what we're pushing on, versus the things that they might be using notifications to sort of curate, and in case you missed it, list of important stuff that they might come back to later. And we haven't really been able to optimize around that kind of concept because the, the data is too limited. Yeah, an hour seems actually like a an eternity in yes. sort of push time. Um, I have one thing to add to that. I think there's this other data wise, like this kind of theory that I have is like this indirect opens. So like mm. someone might not open the push alert, but it triggers this like, oh, Bloomberg. And maybe they don't open it from the push alert, but then they're on their phone and they open the Bloomberg app like, you know, 15 minutes later, half an hour uh -huh. later. So it's not really attributed to that opens number, but it is like, and it's, it's, kind of purely theoretical at this point, but like that is like an indirect open for a push. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so we only have a couple more minutes. I feel like we could probably talk all night, uh, but I wanted to sort of ask a question that I've been wondering about for a while um, and that Pete's report touches on, um, which is the availability in iOS at least of rich media. 
and the fact that so few organizations are taking full advantage of it. Um, we did an experiment for the inauguration using a live video stream and we were really excited about it and we were very proud of the Jingle Bell Rock. Um, uh, we were very proud of the fact that we had like done it first and we kept thinking, well, it's just a matter of time before everyone's doing rich media and someone else sort of does a live video stream. Um, and it's been, it seems like it's been just been very slow to catch on, even if it's happening a little bit more. Is it a tools thing? Is it a limitation in terms of workflow? Um, is it just not seen as sort of a good use of that space? Anyone? I think, I think for us, we've, we've spent kind of a little while uh, thinking about um, just getting the language right of the, of mm -hmm. the notification and just, I think the, the kind of the rich media thing has been a bit secondary for us. We haven't really thought about it too much apart from obviously the experiments and so on. Um, and it probably will end up um, being a tools thing. Um, I do wonder kind of how useful it is. I think if it's, mm -hmm. if it's uh, like a goal or like a match report and you're showing like the key moment of the match, I think that's fantastic in video form. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, I, I'm not entirely convinced yet. Yeah, I'm, I love the idea of watching live video on my lock screen. Um, I forget which, there's like a sports app, maybe it's MLB's app that like you can watch, you can watch the games like from their push alerts, which I think is awesome. Um, so the language issue, you know, I think is is not insignificant, but it's also the timing of it. If you have, if you're pushing uh, like a, a live TV show that is 20 minutes long um, and someone doesn't see it until the program has ended, what do they see? Does the alert disappear? Does the kind of the language in the alert change as significant things happen during the segment um, to act as a prompt? There's kind of like, it kind of needs like constant tending to mm -hmm. um, in a way, which I think has been a, a bit of a blocker. I don't have too much to add except that, I mean, when we introduced Rich Push, it was basically with uh, photos in the push notifications. I like them. I think they look better. But when we did this in April, I believe, in the WSJ app, we didn't see any across the board increase, measurable increase in open rates. So it doesn't seem like photos themselves made the pushes more engaging for our audience. That said, you know, video is a whole different can of worms. And we, while we support video, we hardly ever have a video ready when we want to push it. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of it has, has been based on workflow, you know, where we certainly enterprise projects can have like a main video that goes along with them and that's ready at the time of publication and, and when you might get ready to send that push. But the vast majority of cases, you know, while you might have gotten a photo on the story, you know, by the moment of publishing it, a video is a, a much higher, you know, a harder ask and, uh, it's probably something that we'll, we'll continue to look into and pursue because, I mean, I think in the same way, we haven't really embraced it. You know, we've just uh, wired up photos to be shown there. And right. Could be an opportunity when we uh, sort of invest a little bit more into it. Sounds like maybe we need um, an audience study to see if people actually really like those things, too. Right. Looking well, right at you, Pete. Certainly the Wall Street Journal isn't, isn't a particularly visual brand, but you know, in places where we have charts uh, as sort of a top image on a story, those I think work incredibly well as a rich push, but that's a small subset of everything we push to. So you know, otherwise, you know, we're often the photo is like the Capitol building, or you know, how many exterior shots of the Goldman Sachs building do you want to put in a push notification? <laughs> Not that interesting. So for us, it's, it seems like it's been a lower priority for us for that reason. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. But you have great illustrations. You could make some. That's true. And we have taken jobs. advantage of those. Yeah. And, and some of those pushes have looked great. So I personally like them. But it's, I guess it's a small subset where they're really adding value. Sure, sure. Um, OK, I think we are out of time, unfortunately. But we are definitely still have lots of time for questions. Um, Pete, if you wanted to join us again and uh, I don't know if we have a setup for, maybe we could spare one of our mics. You are, okay, great. Anyone? Hi, hello. Hi, thanks so much for um, your insightful discussion. Um, we talked a lot about metrics and um, I'm curious to s know how you benchmark your metrics. Um, I know that push is still very new and um, do you benchmark against your in-app metrics or on web? 
um, and how do you differentiate what looks like success for you? Good question. Uh, well, we've, we've done some quite um, uh, sort of basic testing of just comparing our sort of breaking news notifications versus our some more featurey and uh, less urgent notifications. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's scientific enough to call it benchmarking. It's me with a spreadsheet and it's the first thing I do on Monday morning, it's quite <laughs> dull. Um, but it does just give us a sense of how they perform and there are sort of slight variations between how well say like a breaking news notification does both in terms of the page views it gets and the attention time. Those are kind of the two metrics that I'm worried about at the moment. Um, but as I say, it's not probably scientific enough to call it benchmarking. But it has been very useful for our newsroom in kind of getting them familiar uh, with sort of what partial success looks like and at least what we should be focusing on in a, in a little way. Yeah, is any of that data public? Like, do you look at what brand, like retail brands do um, in terms of pushing notifications to their customers, maybe um, in terms of open rates and other engagement? I mean, I, I certainly don't have any visibility into the success of other, uh, but I, I think news brands are completely different from, uh, from brands that are sending out pushes that there's a deal for the next three hours only. Um, you know, and that's evident in the, met in the metrics that our partner provides, right? So uh, this indirect open rate is something that is an out-of-the-box metric from Urban Airship as well, but that starts counting any open of the app that's not from a tap, but it, it, they start the clock after the push is sent and they let it run for 12 hours. But if another push is sent before that 12 hours elapses, the clock starts again. So you can't compare the indirect open rate on one push versus another because the amount of time that that indirect open would have been counting is different. So we have only looked at direct opens and uh, we have taken a quite data heavy approach to sort of getting that feedback because you know, we were initially, you know, when we were measuring it against our entire install base that was opted in, the Wall Street Journal app has been around for a while and we have a pretty tech, uh, not, I wouldn't say tech-savvy audience, but an audience that has money to upgrade their phones regularly and their iPads <laughs> regularly. So, you know, when a device, when, it, when your old iPad 2 is put in your bedside table drawer and it just, you know, the battery dies and you never use it again, but you happened to be opted in when it died, uh, the, well, that was still considered part of our push audience, which was pretty unrealistic. So we, we sort of derived our own metric that looked only at opted in devices that had opened the app in the previous eight weeks. And so when we started optimizing around that number, sort of the at least mildly engaged audience to visit us anyway, at least once in two months, we figure those are people that we should want to engage with every single push notification. And so when we started really um, looking at that and optimizing strategy around that, we were, the learnings we derived were actually, you know, they compounded, we had a really good feedback loop that really increased our averages. So right now, every week, uh, we look at push notifications and we separate the breaking news from the categories from the author follow pushes. And we look at the week's average and we compare every push against a rolling eight week, I believe a rolling eight week average. So every week we update the benchmark and then we look at how did we do this week against that benchmark. So we try to keep it in a rolling sort of mentality of continuous improvement, right? We always want to be better than the benchmark from the past eight weeks. And uh, so we track that overall. We track it on the individual push level. I like to say that we, you know, we reward good performance and we don't punish bad performance because bad performance in terms of an open rate might not account for the fact that it was perfectly useful to someone when they saw it and they got the information they needed and it provided value to them. So we look at the lower performers just to know a little bit better about what engages people, what brings them into the app versus what doesn't. Uh, and we've learned a lot from that. But we are definitely aware that the direct open metric is only telling us one part of the story and that's like the second level deep uh, of the story of a given push. It's definitely apparent from, from the report and also from just the, the extent to which you've had to sort of jump through several hoops to try to get at a meaningful metric that the metrics that we have and the ways that we can read against sort of all the complexities of devices are really not optimal. Um, especially the, the sort of notion that you could be satisfying someone's curiosity or need for news just by delivering the alert and not having them take any action on it other than looking at it. We call it the dinner table conversation metric. Mm -hmm. It gives you a good <laughs> nugget for dinner table. That's a good one, yeah, yeah. 
Or you could be annoying them utterly and have, you know, it, you just, you, there's just no way to actually, actually really get at that. But it's, it, to, to Harry's point, like a benchmark is, can be a very tricky thing to set in a very concrete way, I think. Just one more. Hey, um, so there's been a lot of conversation about the value of a push alert going beyond open rates and that you can get value out of a push alert passively by reading it and getting the information you need, which I wholeheartedly believe. Um, I see this as being another place that puts pressure on um, at least news organizations that are, that are ad supported, um, where open rates are the only ways you get people into an experience that drives a business model. And I'm curious what you guys think about like how this is yet another place that is sort of like breaking apart the business model that supports a lot of news organizations and how people might approach that or if there are creative ways of doing that or if we're just going to end up seeing like ads incorporated into rich push alerts, which I don't think anybody wants. Sponsored push. I think it's possible, yeah. Um, we actually, we've been working with a team in the UK who are implementing football, by which I mean football in the rest of the world, which we know is soccer, uh, match alerts, um, which will update with the scores and with, with key data. And the, the initial first mock-up had a little space for sponsorship on them, which made me sort of sit up and take notice, but why not? I mean, if it's unobtrusive and it's not, you know. Any other thoughts on that? Um, one thing I will say on that, I do not um, think we're going to see like ads in push alerts uh, anytime soon, but um, <laughs> while we have been talking a lot about like this getting value from just reading it, I, I think for all of us, it's still, push alerts still do drive a considerable amount of traffic into the app and still drive a lot of opens. So there are definitely opportunities to have like, I think smart ad targeting based on stories that are getting push alerts. So if we're um, doing a push alert to a story um, about like a, a markets wrap for the day, um, maybe that story is targeted with certain ads that have um, like big, like the big market movers. So it's maybe not our, our standard ads that are going on um, other, other articles, but maybe they're somehow targeted in a way that they know those stories are getting push alerts and they can um, make those ads more responsive um, or more optimized for mobile in some way. Pete, did that come up at all in your research? I was going to say, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but one of the outlets I spoke to said that ads in push is in their short-term roadmaps. Short-term. Short -term. Short -term. Hey, yeah. There it is. So uh, other than ads and push, have you guys had conversations about maybe other revenue strategies for push alerts like native, <coughs> native advertising or uh, commerce content where you get like affiliate revenue, which I know Garden UK just started doing and is fairly successful uh, project. Have, if, have, have those conversations been part of this? I mean, they, there has been talk about, you know, there's sometimes, um, we have like branded story, branded content stories, or I'll get someone off the mic. Um, branded content stories, or stories that are you know we're trying to hit a certain metric for advertisers. Um, there's sometimes like um, encouragement to do push alerts to those stories uh, to increase views on those stories. But I think f for right now, push at least uh, from my standpoint, push alerts are still very an editorial product. Um, and it's up to the discretion of the news editors and what the news is, and we're not, we're not sending push alerts based, even based on like new product updates to our app. Like it's really purely um, an editorial fo um, facing product, and we've been pretty firm on that. Yeah. I mean, I, I was weird, I was thinking about this uh, last night. Um, I, I think, yeah, it's sort of the, very much an editorial product for us, and I don't think we'd ever push an ad, but I suppose if we could be smart enough with the targeting, uh, and we found people who consistently open a push notification or a string of push notifications, we could then target them and say, if you like The Guardian, give us some money, uh, <laughs> which is you know, a big part of our membership plan at the moment. Um, but you know, I mean, maybe that's uh, sort of you know, not any concrete plan to do that, but I guess guess we could do something like that. I can add, thanks. I can add that, uh, you know, at the journal, we also feel the same way about it being an editorial tool, but of course, you know, 
the business side of a lot of companies gets really excited by push. Like you can interrupt them, you can get right in their face. <laughs> and uh, so they tend to have really high expectations of what push could do for them. And we have avoided that so far, and I am not particularly against it. Now we're a subscription business, so you know it's all about uh, membership and engagement for us. But one thing we've talked about, and you know, the only I've told them that the only way that we'll do it is if it's an opt-in category. Like if people are open to receiving notifications about other subscriber benefits they might not be taking advantage of, or the event that's happening that they should buy tickets to because they're part of the WSJ, uh, you know, membership, they're members. So uh, whenever you know that tends to temper their excitement and, and makes them less interested. Where I'm like, it is okay to offer this type of notification in the app if people opt in to receive them, but you know, fair warning, nobody's gonna do it, so it shouldn't be a big part of your strategy. Like We can talk about doing it, but you should not be relying on it to the extent that you might be thinking that there's an opportunity here. And that's really just, you know, it's a culture, it's a culture change, you know, that, that people see it as just another distribution. We email people about their subscriptions all the time. Why can't we push to them about, you know, that their credit card is expiring or that, uh, or that there's a, a you know, great new wine club that they can sign up for. We do have a wine club. I mean, I'm talking about push notifications on the lock screen. For in-app messaging, whole different, whole different can of worms. If people are already in the front door, yeah, we, we definitely have looser expectations of what we would push to them. The t I, we don't have in-app messaging right now, so if you have something to share. We don't at the moment either, but that's kind of just a, a takeoff on what could potentially be another, another way to um, push more native, native content is if I think there's like a, a lower threshold to do in-app messaging. So those like dialogue boxes that pop up once you're within an app um, that don't show up on the lock screen. Um, I think there's some potential there. The one um, potential piece of, uh, or example that I can share is from an experiment that we did, um, which was uh, a live data notification around the election. And um, we send out surveys after each experiment we do. And of course, we're not working within the constraints or within the sort of like challenges that core or colleagues in the Guardian core apps have. Um, uh, but what we did was we asked people um, what they thought, as we do after all our experiments, on a, a lot of sort of multiple choice questions, and then we left a space at the end for open feedback. Um, and out of 9,000 people who answered, we did get more than a handful saying that they would be willing to contribute, that it was the kind of thing that the, that, that kind of content, um, and I, I am sort of patting us, ourselves on the back, which I don't mean to sound like this is the only thing that I'm doing, but, um, but just because that they felt that there was utility in that piece of content, they felt motivated to say that they would be willing to uh, become members or to contribute to The Guardian, which I thought was a really interesting sort of, I don't know exactly what you do with that. I'm sure someone who is much more expert in membership would sort of start thinking about what, how to sort of use that or how to make sort of editorial and product utility into something actually monetizable. Um, but it seemed like there was potential there. Um, couple questions back here. It might be just uh, short, but sort of since you just mentioned um, uh, pushes that are related to um, that drive a particular kind of engagement more, like a survey or poll or discussion, I wanted to ask how um, how much everyone does those and and how much how the metrics differ with those if you have. I think our metrics differ quite a bit because we're working. The Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab is meant purely to experiment. We're not sort of doing, we're not sort of serving the main audience with a daily update or a, or a daily sort of set of alerts on, um, on main news. So I think what we do is probably sort of um, rare among, among others. I, I feel like we've learned so much just from asking people what they think that I would 
say I would encourage everyone to do it at some point if they can and do it in a way that makes sense for their audience and for their brand. Um, but I think it's, it sort of needs to be done thoughtfully. So this question builds on some of the other things we've talked about, but I'm curious, particularly for those of you who don't work with a strong um, subscription model or like very stringent paywall, how you talk about or decide in concert with like senior editorial leadership, what metrics to focus on and how you define success, particularly because unique visitors has become the overwhelmingly important metric in a lot of newsrooms and push alerts specifically incentivize and engage like the highest returning and most loyal customers who only count for you once a month. And so there's this tension there in, in other products too, like newsletters, push alerts, where you want people to be engaged, but in many ways it doesn't really help you. So is the question, sorry. I guess like how, like do those issues come up in your discussions of push alerts and how you determine whether they're successful do you get pressure to you know, be more driven toward people clicking through in order to capture as many unique visitors as possible? Like, How do you navigate that tension, if it's ever come up at all? Yeah, I think one of the things um, that we've, we try, in addition to click unique views from <clears throat> push alerts, we also look at um, session duration and the number of sessions in the app that um, a push alert has driven. So that can also kind of supplement some of the statistics that we might give senior management saying like, okay, there's this, drove this number of unique views. Also, the people who come via push alert tend to be kind of fleeting. Um, you know, we want, how do we turn them into daily active users or people who are returning more frequently? Um, so if we can say it, you know, their session duration was this long or it drove this, this many, they came to like three articles via the push alert. Um, that kind of helps supplement our argument of they're becoming more regular app users um, and more comfortable with our app. If I can do some shameless self-promotion, there's an entire chapter in the report which is dedicated to objectives and uh, conceptualization of success. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. So, speaking of tools, having better tools for the future, uh, are you planning to use or are you already use, using or is it possible to use the data that you have from your own users and members or even from logins from Facebook to do not more target uh, push notifications or even niche notifications? And if I can, a second question. Uh, I've noticed all examples and experiments so far for consumption, uh, basically, basically only consumption. Are you seeing any type of push notifications that are also trying to build a community to make people waiting? Sorry, to make people? Waiting, comment, or uh -huh. uh, build a community around something. Uh -huh. uh, I can speak to at least the first part. At the journal, we certainly haven't done anything. We haven't seen push as a way to sort of build a community around a given issue, but also not necessarily the, the, the thrust of our coverage. But in terms of tagging and, and segmenting and building interest groups, like that can get as granular as any news organization wants, right? The Wall Street Journal had this uh, companion app called uh, WSJ What's News. And it recently, we shuttered it this year, but took a lot of the learnings from that experiment into our main app. But one of the things that that, that, that app offered was granular notification-based following of certain topics. And we built this into that CMS that was powering that app so that you, know, you, could ha you can follow a Trump tag or a Clinton tag or a Fed tag or an interest rate tag. Like, uh, we got pretty granular with it, as well as a bunch of world news and US news topics. And uh, we were excited about the granular possibilities of, of allowing people to follow these individual topics, things that we knew we would cover again and again. But it very soon became an incredibly unweighty thing to manage, right? Because with all of these tags, you don't want to let all of them lay fallow. Or when people go to that tag in their app, they see a, a list with like one or two pushes, and it doesn't seem like we're there. Uh, and then just the, the workflow was 
pretty much entirely based on people knowing what tags had been created for various storylines and remembering to use them again or and especially remembering to spell them right when they're you know identifying the tag to push to I think you get it can get incredibly granular and if you have a you know a proper staff and proper resources focusing on that and built up to to support that kind of granular targeting the sky's the limit I mean you can do as much as you put in you get out of that as much as you put into it I think we just found that it, it was for us it was the level that we were aspiring to uh, we were not really able to commit resources to back that up on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, that's something that in our main app we haven't replicated that but when we've thought about it we've been thinking about what are ways what are the ways to do this that don't repeat the mistakes uh, of before and and have it be dependent on a shared knowledge base that doesn't really exist and that you know when we have a gigantic newsroom with a lot of editors uh, it's impossible to keep on top of that but the tools allows for allows uh, the tools allow for it and the technology allows for it so it's really about you know prioritizing it and, and investing in it I think yeah one thing I'll say we don't do this now but that would be interesting around community building is we've talked a lot about following topics um, but the ability to follow a live blog or a developing story uh, um, and saying you want more push alerts or updates based on the updates to that story or updates to the live blog, which is something that I think the, the RIP Breaking News app did really well. Um, <laughs> and that I think that that's an interesting way to kind of to build communities around certain stories. Let's all collectively pour one out for RIP Breaking <laughs> News app. Sure. Um, okay, any other thoughts, Pete? No, uh, okay. I guess we have to wrap up there, so just please show our appreciation for this fabulous panel. <laughs> yeah, and there is booze and fun snacks and everything in the back, so please, please enjoy all of the above, thank you.